As I say, especially with things that aren't currently green, those things with, with global change are seen of more than likely to be green. So we need to start looking at where their distributions are and what's going to happen. Dave? Just one of the. When you're saying, okay, the areas that are conserved, you don't need to worry about those because they are in the same form of conservation. But has anyone done that? an assessment to actually see are they effective in actually looking after that species or that habitat. And then, so make sure that the house is clean first before we go outside. Yeah, I totally agree with you. One of the talks this morning illustrated that point. That there's something like only 44% effective at this stage. I'm not saying we need to pull the resources out of those areas. We just need to shift the focus yeah. and allocate some resources to the other side. Yeah. Okay, any questions further? Thank you, Ian. That was really great. Um, do we have any chairs next to each other for people to sit if required? Or else now's your time to vacate to the next talk before we get on to the next speaker. You are missing the best talk. Okay, everybody ready? Okay, great. Um, our next speaker is Willine Ulefu, who is from the Department of Environmental Affairs and is going to speak to us about the National Biodiversity Stewardship Program, so and the progress and the challenges involved there. So thanks, Willine. Can everybody hear me like this? Good. Now I just need to figure out. Ah, good. Um, conservation challenges that we're facing, just an overview of what we're facing nationally. Um, wetlands are the most threatened of all South Africa's ecosystems, there they are. 48% um, of wetland ecosystems are critically endangered. Wetlands make out 2.4% of the total area, so it's not a lot that we need to conserve. Um, and they're crucial for purifying water and regulating flow. Uh, the high water yield areas in South Africa make up less than 4% of the country's total area. Again, not a lot. Currently, 18%, only 18% have any kind of formal protection. Um, oh, goody. Tributaries are generally in a better condition than less threatened main rivers. Um, this, is the, this is the time to actually look at tributaries and keep them in that good condition so that our main rivers can have a better chance of surviving. Um, coastal and inshore ecosystems are more threatened than offshore ecosystems. We need to look at our coasts, and Jean's sea plan presentation yesterday brought that up very clearly. 24% um, of coastal and inshore ecosystems are critically endangered, compared with only 12% of <coughs> offshore ecosystems. 70% 70 70 of the coast has some form of development within 100 meters of the shoreline. That's not very far. Um, nearly a quarter of South Africa's population lives within 30 kilo kilometers of the coast. So that's where the pressure is. Um, a national coastal biodiversity plan to e identify coastal ecosystem priority areas is kind of important. <coughs> St. Lucia is in a poor state. We, most of us know about that. Um, it makes up more than half of South Africa's estuarine uh, area, which is important if we look at our fish as a sustainable food resource. Um, and restoring the health of St. Lucia can only happen if we look at the Umfalozi catchment area. Uh, Rates of loss of natural habitat are high in parts of the country. In a few of the provinces, by 2050, we will have nothing outside of protected areas left. That's KZN 1994, 2000, 2005, 2008. The blue are the parts that's not left anymore. Uh, we have over 2,000 medicinal plant species. 665 of that are traded, and of those, 57 are threatened. Seven of those are critically endangered. Um, 
the traditional medicine trade is worth nearly three billion. That was the 2007 figure. It's probably a lot more now. And it employs uh, 130,000 people. Alien invasives in, 19, in the mid 1990s, there was 10 million, and it has doubled to 20 million by 2007. We're losing the battle. Um, about 6.5 billion rands worth of <coughs> ecosystem services, water and grazing are lost every year as a result of this. Um, and we do need to scale up the work on alien invasives. And the biodiversity stewardship program is very well positioned to do something about this. Uh, Mark has said some, <laughs> has made some interesting suggestions to this morning that we do need to look at. And what can the stewardship program do? It can put important wetlands, catchments, rivers, estuaries and priority areas for expansion under conservation or under sustainable management. Um, even if they are on private land and without the need to acquire the land. They can create and expand world <coughs> heritage sites, biodiversity core areas without the need for acquisition. They can secure offsets in CBAs at the cost of developers. They can create cre effective buffers for protected areas, <coughs> secure biosphere and world heritage site buffers with sustainable management practices. They can secure investment into rehabilitation projects to ensure that the advantage of rehabilitation is maintained over time. And they can secure climate change corridors. Stewardship is a success story. And it consists of contracts with private and communal landowners to protect land of high biodiversity importance. In 2004, Stewardship consisted of one pilot project in one province. Seven years later, we have six provinces, uh, 27 nature reserves, over 100 more waiting proclamation or in negotiations. Um, if all of these are successfully proclaimed, we will put half a million hectares under conservation. And that's 16% of the 2013 target. Um, it's at a low cost for, to the state because it's contract costs and support costs instead of acquisition. Um, for modest extra resources, we co could expand the contribution of biodiversity stewardship and we can include river and wetland ecosystems in this program. Um, we're busy with a business case to see if we can get funding for the provinces to implement. And <coughs> the business case is basically about stewardship being an off-budget mechanism for securing ecological infrastructure. It proposes the implementation of national and provincial revenue fund CAPEX and OPEX items, specifically for implementation of stewardship. Um, it provides economic benefit within the green economy context, but there's no such thing as a free lunch. Every time you tell politicians it's cheap, they think they don't need to put anything extra on the table. Um, costing that we looked at in the, in the business case is um, the expansion regi regime in, the, in Pius with a 20-year target, which is 2028. Um, the target is 10.7 million hectares. The model syncs with the 10-year, 20-year targets. We took 20, 2009 as year one of the empires. We are now in year four, um, and 2028 is year 20. Um, in year four, the model says that we will have three provinces implementing, Western Cape, KZN, and Pumalanga. Year five will be Eastern Cape, Gauteng, and Northern Cape. We're a bit ahead of that because Eastern Cape has proclaimed their first protected environment. Um, year six is Limpopo, Northwestern Free State. The staffing regime that the, the business case is looking at is a total of 33 staff in year one, uh, in year four. And we will need, in order to meet the targets, we will need 257 staff. In year 20. 
Um, the assumptions that we've made in the staffing regime is that we will need program managers, negotiators, facilitators, uh, with, with a ratio of 15 sites for each facilitator at the, in the maintenance phase, legal officers, stewardship system ecologists, and land surveyors. <coughs> Uh, the total cost of biodiversity stewardship in order to reach the 20-year empire's target is 2.8 billion. Not exactly small change. But if you look at acquisition cost, it's 101 billion. So there's a huge difference. <coughs> Implementation bottlenecks that we have experienced, experienced up to now is the operational budget. It doesn't cover what we need to do to get to the targets. Proclamation cost, for instance, is 75,000 rand a site, more or less, give or take, depending on where you are. <coughs> um, posts, 12 to 15 sites per, per facilitator, and then the facilitator has to maintain those sites and they, they don't have any more time to spend on proclamation. So you need to appoint a new facilitator after you reach that. Uh, training, if we look at the amount of people we will need over the next 20 years, we will need to start training very quickly. Because the trained staff just doesn't exist in those numbers. Support staff, we need ecologists, we need uh, Species specialists, legal officials, legal clerks, notaries, surveyors, all kinds of people, and admin support people, and GIS people. Uh, if we pay 200,000 per year for a retainer for a notary, from that we can get 20 deeds plus 30 hours, more or less. As for a surveyor on retainer, if you're lucky and you case it in and you get a nice cheap surveyor, um, it will cost you 11,500 per diagram. KZN uses a surveyor for one in each four, five sites. Western Cape needs a surveyor for four out of five sites because they don't proclaim the whole land parcel. Um, status of biodiversity stewardship in South Africa. Uh, those are in operating, the others are in development, they've appointed people to do the work, but the work hasn't really started yet. Um, these are the number of sites that are either proclaimed or in negotiation to be proclaimed. Um, 140 sites, um, just short of 500,000 hectares. If we count them up at the end of the day, it might just be over for 500,000. Um, these are the targets, the Empire's targets for 2013 that stewardship will contribute if we proclaim all the ones that we're negotiating at the moment. Uh, KZN is very comfortably situated with 70% of their target will, that will be reached. The others like Northern Cape is a bit of a problem. Uh, this is what it looks like on a graph. KZN um, Gauteng's one, that one's dicey, I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, this is the human, the, the resources in terms of human resources and funding that, that the provinces have, it's not a lot. What we've managed to do at the moment is kind of a miracle because there's no money and no staff in most of the cases. The way forward is to get the policy approved finalize the business case, submit to Treasury for funding, uh, set up the advisory committee at the HOD level to coordinate implementation and information exchange, facilitate implementation in all the provinces, get the database system up and running, integrate with the National Protected Areas database, get reactive stewardship incorporated into the process. This is a very big um, opportunity, but it is also a a risk because you can't really plan for it um, and get the annual reporting process started. The lessons learned is a snowball effect. Once you start, it grows quicker than you can grow. Um, the maintenance cost of agreement, the demand for reactive stewardship, 
plan for future increase in budget and staff. This happens with your normal land acquisition processes. It has to happen with stewardship as well. Um, need for interactive support from NGOs, conservation sections, land care, and most of all, land owner <coughs> relationships. We need to start doing things differently. <laughs> In the witness protection program. <laughs> Do we have any questions, Joe? Uh, thanks. I I'm trying to orientate myself around, you know, the stewardship nationally and um, and what is happening in, in in the provinces, you know. Uh, but I I also noticed that. Um, 